Okay, so we see that we've got the secular growth problem in this example of the qubit coupled to the uh, thermal bath. So what we're going to do here is we're going to introduce the notion of a master equation, and it's going to allow us access to late times very much in the same way as this example of uh, decay, decay problems uh, in uh, particle physics that we mentioned earlier. And what we're going to do here is we're going to get our hands quite dirty with some math, um, but at the end, we will tie it all back to what's the qubits doing with some concrete uh, equations. So uh, bear with me. So what we're going to do here is derive a master equation, which is essentially an equation of motion for only the reduced density matrix sigma of i. And what we're going to do is we're going to derive this equation of motion from the underlying von Neumann equation that we quoted earlier. So one version we had of the von Neumann equation is where we had the rate of change of rho of i, which is proportional to a commutator. Um, this is, of course, in the interaction picture. We also had another version of the von Neumann equation, which was the same equation, just written in integral form. So we needed to pick some initial state, rho of i at time t equals zero. And on the right-hand side, we have an integral over this commutator. And importantly, I want to underline that um, we have a rho of i of s being integrated from zero to t in this equation. So as far as deriving a kind of rudimentary master equation, there is a version of the von Neumann equation, which is going to be much more useful for us, which is combining the previous two versions of this equation. It seems maybe a little uh, useless to do this, but trust me, we're going to get somewhere with this version of the equation. So what we're going to do in uh, the first version of the von Neumann equation, we've got an expression for rho of i of t on the right-hand side. And that's what our second equation gives us, is basically an integral version of this. So what we're going to do is we're going to insert our second equation into the right-hand side of the first equation. And when we do this, we get what's called the von Neumann equation in integral differential form. So what this means is that the right-hand side, we've got a time derivative. And on the right-hand side, we've got an integral. So these types of uh, equations are called integral differential equations in general. And basically, the structure of this equation is we've got a commutator with the initial states uh, as the first term, which is actually the less important term. But the second term is uh, basically a double commutator, uh, which integrates over uh, this history that goes from 0 to t. So, so far, just to underline, this is not anything different than the first von Neumann equation we started out with. It's just written in a slightly more convoluted form, but it's going to be very useful for us when trying to derive a master equation. So what we're going to do here is we're going to take the so-called Born approximation, and we're going to assume that the open system is so tiny that it doesn't affect the bath at all. So what this means is we're going to, on the right-hand side of our integral differential equation, which is really just the von Neumann equation, we're going to assume that rho of i is approximately equal to rho i of t tensored with the environment's initial state. And uh, because we started out with an uncorrelated initial state, this is actually a quite a good approximation to make here. Any correlations that start between the system and the environment, it's going to be some series in G at higher order in G. And since we're just tracking this equation to order g squared anyways, we don't need to uh, look at that any further. But what we're going to do is we're going to plug this into the double commutator in our integral differential equation. And what we do is then we can trace both sides of the equation now, since we've got this uncorrelated form. And we get this kind of terse looking equation in which we have these operators that appeared in our interaction Hamiltonian, S and E appearing. So the structure, just picking this all apart, is we've got a rate of change of uh, sigma i is equal to a commutator with the initial state of sigma i. And then the most important term is this last term, which is proportional to g squared, which is an integral from 0 to t 
over these operators in the system and the environment, E and S, and commutators of uh, sigma of I. And the HC here is just supposed to denote the permission conjugate of the first term appearing in this big round bracket. And then finally, the uh, brackets here along the operators E, that's supposed to denote an average in the environment's initial state, the thermal state as we're gonna assume for the qubit problem. And uh, this is basically means that in this term that goes like order G squared, we've got environment correlations functions appearing, which are gonna be important for what comes next. So this master equation is the so-called Born approximation. Um, and it's our first ever master equation. And it gives us considerable progress over our earlier perturbation theory answer. And the idea is now we've got a differential equation, so we should be able to integrate it to much later times than just our ordinary perturbation series. So bringing this kind of complicated equation to a particular example of our qubit coupled to a thermal bath, what we'd find for the Born approximation is that we get an integral differential equation, which we've got written here. So whenever we've got times much greater than the inverse uh, temperature in the bath, we'd get a term, which we've kind of already seen in, in this video already, which is suppressed by a Bose-Einstein factor. Uh, but we've got a correction, which goes like g squared, which is an integral uh, from zero to t over the environment's correlation function, the real part of the environment's correlation function, times uh, the cosine of the qubits gap with, with S, and then most importantly, the qubits state sigma one one evaluated at T minus S. So this has a convolution type structure. Uh, the qubit state is being convolved with the cosine factor in the environment correlation function. And this integral differential equation turns out to be very tricky to solve, uh, even for the most simple uh, correlation functions. And this is kind of a generic statement that even numerically, these are hard equations to solve. So what we often do with the Born approximation is we take an additional approximation, which helps us make progress. And this approximation is called the Markovian approximation. The logic of the Markovian approximation is what allows us to simplify this equation, which basically what it does is it eliminates the S dependence in this convolution integral that appears in the Born approximation. So what we wanna do basically is convert the integral over T minus S. We want it this just to just depend on the parameter T so that this becomes a very simple ordinary differential equation. So what we do in the Markovian approximation is we assume that the thermal bath has some correlation time tau of C associated with it. So what this means is that there's some damping uh, with this correlation time. And uh, this is very commonly the case in these types of problems. So typically when the environment is a thermal bath, the correlation time scale is just related to the inverse temperature of the bath. So tau of C is related to beta by some constant. So what we do after we assume this is in the Markovian approximation, we assume that the rate of change of our reduced density matrix sigma of i is extremely slow compared to the correlation time Tc in the environment. So under this approximation, the open system has no memory in the system. So it's time local, as it's often said. And what this means is that in all of these convolutions that we see, particularly in, in the example we just flashed, we can replace anywhere that we have a T minus S, we can just replace a T underneath any integral signs uh, that, that appear. So what this leaves us with is a time local master equation. So basically we just replace T minus S with T, which we've highlighted here. And these types of equations are said to be Markovian. So going back to our qubit example, You'll remember our Born master equation told us that the one one component of our qubit has this integral differential uh, equation structure, and which problematically we saw that there is this t minus s dependence in the qubit component on the right hand side. 
that appeared in a convolution integral. So in the Markovian approximation, what ends up happening is we basically can just approximate t minus s by t in this integral. And when we assume that our time scales are much greater than beta for the correlation time in the thermal bath, we can take the limit on the upper integral to be infinity. And now we've just simply got some function, which is just an integral times sigma one one evaluated at t. And once we go through these operations, what we're left with is this equation. So we've got something that scales like g squared omega divided by two pi all in front. We've got a Bose-Einstein distribution minus a hyperbolic cotangent, which depends on beta omega over two. And then we're multiplying by the qubit state sigma one one at time t. So this is a Markovian master equation uh, for our one one component. And what's very nice is that we can integrate this very easily. This is just the ordinary differential equation. And when you go through this process, what you find is you get a uh, Fermi-Dirac distribution, a one uh, over e beta omega plus one, and then times one minus e to the minus gamma t, where gamma we're just defining as this rate, which scales like g squared omega over two pi times this hyperbolic cotangent. So this gives us a decay to a Fermi-Dirac distribution at very late times. And what's also interesting is similar to our earlier problem, when gamma t is something very small, we can expand the exponential in just a Taylor series. And what we return once you do the math is basically the perturbation series answer. It's something that goes like g squared t uh, times this Bose-Einstein factor. And this tells us that the secular growth answer was in fact correct, but only for early times. And it's the master equation which gave, gave us access to very late times. And, and just to clarify, you're saying like the, the correct answer there for uh, sigma one one, we get this Fermi Dirac distribution. That's because we expect this because it's um, a two level system, right? Uh, essentially, yeah. And it's really what you'll find is in, in fact that our free Hamiltonian was something basically that scaled like omega in the first diagonal, minus omega in the second diagonal. And when we're what we're going to find is that at late times, we're going to just get a thermal state. So we have e to the minus beta of this qubit's free Hamiltonian. And that's basically where that Fermi-Dirac distribution comes from on the diagonals. And on the off diagonals, we'll just get zeros. So we might start off with something non-zero in the off diagonals, but uh, we're going to basically tend towards something that only is something on the diagonals in the system. Mm -hmm. And this is basically called decoherence when any quantum coherence uh, gets killed by interactions with the bath. Okay. Yeah. And that's kind of a generally very interesting to study with open quantum systems. Um, it's the fact that any kind of quantum correlations, they seem to generically get lost when we interact with a larger bath. And it kind of explains in a way how in our macroscopic world, we don't see these quantum correlations appearing in any significant way. It's one way to think about it at least. So finally, Reverting back to our earlier Markovian master equation, for our qubit model, what we might do is we can use the form of our interaction Hamiltonian, which we explicitly wrote down earlier. It's just a two by two matrix tensored with the bosonic field operator. When we insert this into our Markovian master equation, we basically just get some correlation functions with uh, these bosonic field operators multiplied by some poly matrices. And this is the equation that you get at the end of the day. And what we're going to do is basically assume that we're going to probe times much greater than the correlation time in the bath, which means we're going to take the uh, integral on the, uh, the upper limit on the integral to be infinity. And what you'll notice is we're just going to have some integrals over the bath correlation functions, these phi phi uh, uh, averages. And we're going to get these integrals multiplying this density matrix sigma of i of t. Now, when you work through these integrals, what you eventually find is that you can define these operators A, which multiply sigma of i. And uh, these A operators are given in this equation. And the point is, is that once we convert this equation back to the Schrodinger picture, 
we get the so-called Lindblad equation, which depends on these A operators or jump operators as they're often called, multiplying the reduced density matrix. And there's gonna be some numerical coefficients CNM uh, appearing uh, in the sum, which basically are coupled with these jump operators. And in this uh, Schrodinger picture equation, we've also gonna, we're gonna find usually a commutator term, which goes like some operator O commuting with the reduced density matrix in the Schrodinger picture uh, multiplied by minus I. And so there's a couple of things to point out here generally. Uh, so what we find is that this first term, which is just a commutator, has the structure of a von Neumann equation if you ignore the rest of the equation. So this term is in a sense describing the unitary part of the evolution uh, of the open system. But what's interesting in this so-called Lindblad form is that these second terms show how there's these non-unitary corrections that come into play once we start interacting with an environment. And it's these non-unitary interactions which allow the open system to lose information and to dissipate energy into the bath. And um, so, and, uh, and I, these are also the terms which are responsible for effects like decoherence and states losing their purity and so becoming mixed. So finally, I wanna tie this all together uh, and explain why I'm interested in these topics, um, particularly the connection between secular growth and open quantum systems. And the reason is because I'm interested in studying quantum systems that are put into gravitational backgrounds. So this is uh, basically quantum field theories in curved space time, or more generally just effective field theories uh, for gravity. Um, and the reason I'm interested in this is because whenever there's a horizon in your gravitational background, so let's say like Schwarzschild space, uh, the space time describing a black hole with no spin, uh, you have an event horizon in which basically uh, nothing can escape the event horizon, not even light. And this basically, this barrier of the event horizon, once you start putting a quantum system there, this barrier acts as a splitting between a system and an environment in a sense. So there's a way in which the degrees of freedom outside the horizon can be understood as um, your system. And those hidden behind the event horizon can be understood as an environment. And they are still interacting with each other. They know they're there, but we're only able to really track what the system is doing. And so what ends up happening is these open quantum systems methods, they, they, they seem to translate very well and they seem to work very well in these scenarios. And finally, the secular growth connection, uh, it turns out that whenever you're doing these quantum field theory back, uh, calculations in these gravitational backgrounds, you sometimes see these secular effect, uh, these secular growth effects cropping up, and they're often a signal uh, to the person calculating that maybe these open quantum system methods are going to be useful here. And they're kind of often the surprise the first time you see them that you'll maybe calculate some loop using your quantum field theory, and you'll see that it's it's blowing up at you at late times. And because quantum field theories often have divergences of various kinds. The, it, it, it can be somewhat confusing at times if you aren't appreciating that secular growth is an issue. Um, so that's basically why I'm interested in these topics. And um, John, if you'll have me back, I'd love to share some more about that. But yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. We'd love to have you back. Thanks so much for the talk. I'm sure everyone's going to, uh, to love it. So uh, for everyone uh, watching, I hope you enjoyed uh, the video. If you did, uh, feel free to like, subscribe, and leave a comment below.